Happy New Year! On this edition of Commuter Connections, we'll take a look at MDOT MTA's winter weather preparation efforts. MDOT MTA police initiatives are keeping transit services safe. We'll show you how. We've got a look at the MDOT MTA Transit Information Contact Center. There's a hero bus operator among us who's responsible for saving a number of lives. You'll meet him. And we'll check in with Professor Vern to see what he's working on. All here on this edition of Commuter Connections. We've already seen substantial snowfall in regions around us. At some point, it's likely we'll see snow too. You should know MDOT MTA is indeed geared up and ready to get you through whatever winter brings our way. Rome Bennett, Deputy Director of the MDOT MTA Office of Customer and Community Relations, joins us with a look at MDOT MTA winter weather prep. Welcome back to the show, Ron. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Good to have you. So what are a few tips? Let's start off with that. What are a few tips that you would offer transit riders for traveling on transit during inclement weather days? Well, I think one of the key uh, tips to offer our riders is basically staying alert and staying up to date on travel, understanding what's going on, what's taking place on our roadways, whether or not there are delays, whether or not uh, roads are closed and that kind of stuff. And you can get that information by going on our social media. You can get it from our website, certainly listening to our radio station 93.5 will have updates on this type of information. Certainly the main media outlets that pick up our diversions and delays will certainly also have that for you. But I think allowing yourself extra time and understanding and what's going on um, mm -hmm. in and around you is certainly important. Um, also being aware of diversions and whether or not, you know, understanding that if a, a side street that we typically travel down is blocked or not uh, plowed in the case of a snow emergency, then certainly we mm -hmm. stay on the main roads which are usually plowed first. And I see you have a copy of MDOT MTA Snow Guide. Tell us a little bit about what this um, brochure is and some of the information that's contained in it. Sure, uh, the snow guide is a or a winter guide for our riders that we've prepared over 20 years. Um, when you look at it, you'll get information on how to sign up for alerts. Um, you'll also have information on just the various outlets that we um, produce the, the content for. So all the media outlets and, and stuff that you can find our information on. And also, you will have phone numbers in there for our mark service and for our contact information center if you want to call to find out more information about what's going on. Uh, there's also information on how to obtain copies in different languages and different formats. And certainly it's a very good information, a packet of information for our customers to be able to, to stay abreast of what's going on. Okay, it looks like a very handy guide. Where are copies available for patrons? Um, patrons who want to pick up a copy in person can get one from our office at 6 St. Paul Street um, in our context or in the lobby. Uh, we also have copies available online that can be downloaded and printed. And you can also find them in libraries. Um, wherever we have our schedules and also you can call our contact information center and request one to be mailed to you and you can call the 410-539-5000 and request a copy. Oh, okay. So there are lots of different ways to get a hold of it. Certainly is. And is there a cost for the snow guide? The guide's actually free and mm -hmm. so it's something we've been doing for quite a few years and so it's definitely um, something our readers, our writers look forward to. And it seems like a lot of information in there. Roughly how many people does it take to produce this publication? Think from um, production to, uh, uh, from, from putting the content together to production is about uh, a half a dozen people. Mm -hmm. um, certainly you have to put the content together, have it reviewed, and then also have it produced. And this is all done in-house. And how many copies do you normally produce each year? On an annual basis, we start with roughly 30,000 copies. Okay. And then we'll determine if, you know, based on the need and, and, and the request, if, there, if we need to print more in smaller batches. You know, running a transit agency, how far in advance does MDOT MTA normally prepare for winter weather. Safety is always one of our primary goals, so it's on the agenda, you know, as early as we start the fall season mm -hmm. to make sure that we have all the equipment in place, that we have every, you know, all the plans on the table and that everybody's up to speed with what needs to get done in the case of uh, uh, adverse weather conditions come about. So we try to make sure that we're prepared and then we can better service our riders when the, the conditions actually change. So it sounds like it's really good to one, stay tuned in to what's going on with the weather, mm -hmm. definitely get your hands on one of these snow guides. That's correct. And then there are just ways that you can contact MDOT MTA for more information. 
you know, just kind of getting around on transit when the weather is really bad. Certainly, and you know, like I said before, 93.5, our you know, radio station mm -hmm. is very good in providing updates, and then we also farm the information out to the major media outlets. So, you know, you'll always have access to information, social media, uh, whichever platform you're on, you, you will be able to find information on what's going on, and we try to keep our customers informed. And if people just have general questions about MDOT MTA service, where can they go? They can call our contact information center at 410-539-5000, or they can go on our website mta.maryland.gov and they can access information and get additional phone numbers on how to contact the MTA. Wonderful. Well, Ron, again, thanks for coming back on the show. This was very helpful. Hopefully we'll be lucky and have a mild winter this year. Well, I hope so too. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Up next, a look at how MDOT MTA police are working hard to keep transit in our region safe. Stay with us. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Visit us at stoptextstoprex.org. MDOT MTA has been recognized as the safest transit system among the top 12 transit agencies in the nation. That's impressive. It's a distinction made possible only through hard work and professional policing. MDOT MTA Police Captain Kelly Holman joins us with a look at these successful crime-fighting efforts. Welcome back to Commuter Connections. Thank you. So MDOT MTA has been recognized as the safest transit system among the top 12 transit agencies in the country. Tell us a little bit about that recognition and where did it come from? It came from APTA. APTA stands for American Public Transportation Association. They recognized us for having for our transit security program successes and having the lowest part one crimes out of our, the other 12 agencies across the country. We've in the last four years, we've reduced our crime steadily. Mm -hmm. And over the last 10 years, we've reduced crime 62%. Wonderful. Now you mentioned part one crimes. What what are those? Part one crimes are the felonious crimes such as rape, murder, homicide, mm. robbery. Now has MDOT MTA received such a recognition in the past for its efforts? Yes, absolutely. In the last three years we've received that APTA Gold Award for those same uh, transit security programs. Now how important are your law enforcement partnerships? in keeping the transit system safe. Our law enforcement partnerships are vital to our mission and to ensuring that our, our riding public, our transit community are safe. It helps us maintain a reliable, safe, and efficient system while providing world-class customer service. Okay, and who are some of your partners in this effort? We have memos of um, understanding with our local, state, and federal agencies. It's Baltimore City Police, Maryland State Police, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, any law enforcement agency that actually interfaces with MDOT-MTA, we have partnerships with them. Oh, okay. Is keeping a transit system the size of MDOT-MTA safe a challenge? A system that provides public transportation for over 110 million passengers every year, mm -hmm. it's a huge undertaking. So yes, it is a challenge, but it's a challenge that MDOT MTA employees accept daily. And how important would you say um, enforcing sort of those quality of life type violations, like maybe playing music too loud on the system, how important is that to the overall success of maintaining a safe transit system? MDOT-MT police firmly believe in the broken windows theory. If you fix the small things, you can avoid the bigger things. Mm. So we call it a quality of life because it affects our riders' daily quality of life. So if we address those issues, then our riders have a more pleasant experience and they continue to come back. Okay, and when you say quality of life, I know like I mentioned, you know, playing music loudly on the system. What are some other things that could be considered quality of life? Eating, smoking, um, expectorating inside of a transit conveyance that's spitting, or even relieving yourself within the transit community. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not long ago, dedicated bus lanes were installed in a number of streets in downtown Baltimore. Why was this necessary and what's the fine for driving in these dedicated lanes? Well, to ensure that our transit community can get to their destinations, with the installation of the local link and city link, 
it helps the buses get through downtown traffic in a more efficient manner. So the fines related to that violation are $250. Oh, okay. So it's pretty, pretty steep. extensive. Yes, right. it is. Okay. Yes, it is. So how effective has enforcement been around the dedicated bus lanes and what has been the response from drivers as far as adhering to the law? Well, early on in October and November, we did a warning program where we just st we stopped the passengers for being in that lane, and we gave them a verbal warning on letting them know come December we would actually start issuing citations. Again, that fine is $250. So initially, motorists weren't exactly happy, but our riding public has been, has experienced a more easier transport through the downtown area and ridership has increased. Our buses are on time. So it's worked out very well for M.MTA. And can anything other than buses be in those lanes? Only if you're going to be turning at that very same intersection that you're driving in. If you can go past that intersection, then you're stopped and issued a citation. Are more dedicated bus lanes being planned for the area? Absolutely. With the North Avenue Rising Project, there are going to be more bus lane only, only lanes. Now, if transit riders or other members of the public want more information, um, just say, for instance, they want to report a crime or some sort of safety issue to MDOT MTA police, what number can they call? They can call out MDOT MTA Police Dispatch Center. So that's a 410. 454-7720, or they can always just call 911 and it will be routed to us. Kelly, it's always good to talk with you. Thanks again for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Up next, a look at the MDOT MTA Transit Information Contact Center. Stay with us. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. When transit customers have questions or concerns about MDOT MTA service, they call the MDOT MTA Transit Information Contact Center. A group of dedicated professionals there help transit patrons throughout the region get the information they need for travel. Taria Burwell, the manager of the center joins us with a look at her group's mission. Welcome to Commuter Connections. Thank you for having me. So what is MDOT MTA's Transit Information Contact Center and what is the purpose of the center? We're the people behind the phone number on the bus stops. When you stand at the bus stop and you see 410-539-5000, we're going to answer your concerns. Oh, okay. We're the first voice for the MTA. Wonderful. And where is the Transit Information Contact Center located? They call it the Bush Division, but it's located at 1515 Washington Boulevard in Baltimore. Okay. So you said if people call the 410-539-5000 number, they get you. So what are some of the, what kinds of information do you actually assist customers with? We assist them with all the modes of transportation for the MTA, mm -hmm. local bus, mm -hmm. light rail, metro subway, mm -hmm. mark train, commuter bus, and we also have information on the fares for mobility, which is the paratransit component. Okay, so you cover all We cover of the whole, all the modes of the MTA, yes. Okay, and h roughly how many calls would you say that your operators take a day? Oh, that's interesting. Daily, now the customers can self-service or they can opt to be assisted by a live agent. Live agent calls are about 1,200 or more, depending on how the delays and the activity around the city. Mm -hmm. um, now, 2,400 people choose to self-service. So we take about 3,000 calls a day or better. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. And is that just during the weekdays, or does that include seven days a week? Well, we're only open Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. at our main call center. And we have a satellite office called the Mondaman uh, kiosk, and that's over there at the Mondaman Metro on the uh, street level platform. Mm -hmm. And we have two agents there as well and they work 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Oh, okay, so you guys cover a lot of time during the day. During the day, 13 hour day, yes. And roughly how many staffers um, would normally be available to assist customers? During the day at the main call center, there are 19 information coordinators available to help, and the two that are staffed out at Mondawmin. 
So all together, 21. And I understand that you have arrangements and have made provisions for persons with disabilities. So can you tell us a little bit about that? We still have the TTY telephone system where hearing impaired or speech impaired, they can call in and have, have a third party company interact with them. We also receive several Maryland Relay 711 calls mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Oh, okay. And then for language translation, we have a company that we partner with and they're able to translate our conversations up to 250 languages. Oh wow, yeah. oh wow, so you can cover. Cover anybody that calls. That's wonderful. And when is the center the busiest? We have our rush hour peak, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. When we first open, the customers are waiting in the queue, waiting for us to open up. Mm -hmm. And then from around 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And you have an automated voice response system. Yes, we, have, we call it an IVR. Okay. And what it does is it helps the customer self-service. When they dial 410-539-5000, they're able to pick options for what they want. If they want bus, press one. If they want Metro Rail, press two. And they will get the information that they need. They can ask for real time, like when is the bus actually going to show up, or scheduled time. So when you mentioned that, I know we had promoted the transit app. Yes. And we told people if you don't want to, you know, look at it on your phone, that you can actually get the same information. Yes, by calling 410-539-5000. We have the same information on our computer screens, and we're able to give real-time information or scheduled information for Mark Train and the local bus. Okay, that's wonderful. So it's like one-stop shopping at yeah. the Transit Information Contact one Center. One-stop shop, that's right. Taria, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been a lot of very helpful information. Thanks for having me. Last month, Commuter Connections welcomed a new member to our television team. He's Professor Vern, our nerdy, eccentric, but very knowledgeable go-to person for an understanding of all things technical and scientific in transportation. On this edition of the program, Professor Vern meets up with MDOT MT Administrator Kevin Quinn for a look at how the real-time transit app works. Professor Vern, how are you? Ah, good morning, Administrator. Professor Vern, what do you got for us this time? Today? we're going to talk about how the real-time system works for our buses. To start with, the real-time system needs to know the exact location of every bus running service. That's where GPS comes into the picture. GPS, or Global Position System, is used to determine the location of each bus. You know, the longitude and latitude. Every bus has a GPS receiver located inside of it that receives signals from GPS satellites orbiting the Earth. These signals tell the bus exactly how far it is from the satellite. Now, if a bus receives signals from a minimum of three GPS satellites, that bus can determine exactly where it is on the Earth. Now you're probably wondering, well, how do I find my position based on knowing how far I am from three satellites orbiting Earth? Well, it's actually simple. GPS uses a process called trilateration. Essentially, if you imagine that we're trying to locate you on a map of Baltimore, by knowing how far you are from certain landmarks. And to start with, let's say that we know you're 2,600 feet from Shot Tower. Now, if we draw a circle on that map with a radius of 2,600 feet around Shot Tower, we can say that you are definitely somewhere along the circumference of that circle. Now, if we also know that you're 2,100 feet from Lexington Market, and we add a second circle to the map, we can say that you are located at one of the two points where those circles intersect. Next, if we also say that you are 3,000 feet from Oriole Park and add a third circle to our map, then we know that you are located at the point where the three circles intersect, which is right along St. Paul Street. Gotcha. Now, if you change the landmarks and imagine GPS satellites, you can see how GPS can locate objects on the Earth. Well, you're probably wondering, how do we get real-time data by knowing the bus locations. Well, each bus has a cellular modem and it calls the real-time servers that are located in the internet cloud. Now the buses call the servers once every 10 seconds to report their location. The servers are also programmed with all of the bus routes and schedules. Now the servers track the bus through its route, seeing where it's at every 10 seconds, 
the servers can determine when the bus will get at its next bus stop, and then when a bus arrives at the bus stop, the servers can tell, is it on time, is it early, or is it late? Now, the real-time servers send this information through the internet to the passenger information signs and also make this information available for smartphone real-time transit apps. And that's how real-time works, and it's been my pleasure talking about it today. Just ahead, we'll share an amazing story of an MDOT MTA bus operator who stepped in to save a family from fire. That's next. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. MDOT MTA has a lot of very special people within its ranks, people dedicated to hard work and serving. One of them recently stepped up in a heroic way to save a Maryland family victimized by a fire that totally engulfed their home. Today we welcome that hero, MDOT MTA bus operator Dexter Craig and Ms. Monique Hines, whose family was affected by that fire. We welcome you both to Commuter Connections. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for you having us. Me. Dexter, I'll start with you. How long have you actually been an MDOT MTA bus operator? I've been an MDOT MTA bus operator now for a little over a year and a half. You're fairly new to the family, yes. okay. Yes. And how did you happen to end up at the scene of this house fire. Well, this all occurred in the Glendale, Bowie, Maryland area. I was on my way home from work that morning and I had decided to stop and get something to eat from a local food chain. I left the parking lot and after that I was able to see the smoke from the road. I thought in the beginning that maybe it was something industrial, somebody was burning something from an industrial building or something. So I just followed the smoke and that led me to Miss Hines, Miss Hines' home where I pulled up and the car and the home was on fire, one of the vehicles. What's in your thoughts when you arrived at the house? Oh Lord Jesus, it's a fire. Mm. I knew I needed a call for assistance, so I, I, I called 911. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what did you see? What did you do when you got there? When I arrived at the home, the one of the vehicles were on fire, okay. uh, and two of the garage doors were on a blaze, mm. and the room over top of the garage was engulfed in flames as well. Wow, that's scary. I mean. Were you nervous? Were you fearful? The fear came from when I had made the 911 call. Mm -hmm. It seemed like forever. I was telling them, explaining them what was happening. Not so much that the home was on fire, mm -hmm. but uh, the assistance and how long it would take for someone to get there. So how did you manage to, you know, kind of get into the house, get all nine family members out of the house? It, it was three family members that I had pulled from the home. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you actually went in while the house was engulfed in flames? I, I pulled them from the... Wow. Wow. That takes a lot of courage. Yes. And how long did it take from your arrival to when you approached the home to even get everyone out? That I'm not sure of because everything seemed like it was going so quick, mm -hmm. like just happening so quick. Right, because it was just a lot. It was just activity. a lot going on that, that morning. Mm -hmm. It was a lot going on. And neighbors were out and about? Prior to meeting up with Miss Hines and the rest of her family, mm -hmm. I was um, able to blow my horn oh, okay. <laughs> to alarm some of the neighbors. Okay. Monique, I assume that you and your family were asleep when the fire occurred, because you said it was early morning? Yes. Okay, around what time? 2.40 was when I made the, the called to the police. Oh, okay. And were you all asleep inside the home? I had just gotten home from out of town and I had been home for about an hour. I was uh, nursing my daughter when I heard two loud booms. It was like boom, boom. And then I heard a crackling sound and I felt the house move and I knew that wasn't normal. 
So I looked outside of my window and I looked to the right and I saw red. I looked to the left and I saw my mom's vehicle halfway on fire. And I said to myself that if we don't get out of here, we're going to die. Right, so what, what did you do? I mean, what was your next move at that point? You had your children, you had to notify the other family members and it was probably just a lot going on at that time. So my, my next move was to get everybody out. There were so many blessings out of that night and as Dexter already said, things were moving fast. There was a lot, it was chaotic. But one, another blessing was that it was a six bedroom house, but on that particular night, n out of nine people, we were only sleeping in two rooms. Okay. So I went down to my parents' room and I said, it's a real fire, everybody get out now. And then I went back to my room and I got my children up mm -hmm. and I started to go down to the basement, but then I heard a voice inside of me say, no. So then I went back up the stairs. I was moving with my children. Mm. My daughter got afraid, the three-year-old, and ran back towards the house. I thought my mom and my son was with me. They were not. So as I come up the side of the house, this gentleman is running towards mm. me, and I just say, who are you? And he goes, is everybody out of the house? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, my mom and my two children. And as soon as I said that, he flew down and he went back and he got them. And when, they, and when he brought them up, even though everything was moving so fast, it was like he flew down the hill, but he came back up so gracefully with them, so calmly wow. with them. Wow. So you were definitely in the right place at the right time. In the right place at the right time. How are you and your family doing now since the fire? Even though we're all here and no one lost their life on that night, this is like losing someone. Mm -hmm. This is like a death for our family. So we're taking it one day at a time. I mean, your story is compelling. I mean, it's really, and your book, Moving Forward, Walking in Faith, Not Fear. Mm -hmm. Tell me, when did you actually write this book? Because it was prior to the fires, that but is, after you had been sick once before. That is correct. So I wrote this book, I started in 2015, mm -hmm. and it was released in 2017. And my journey is about overcoming your fears. Even after the fire was put out, it was still smoking. And, and I went back to the scene because I wanted to walk through that fear. And Dexter was there the whole time. So when you arrived, you never left. You never stayed left. with them the whole time. Yes. That's wonderful. On behalf of Commuter Connections and the Maryland MDOT MTA, Maryland Transit Administration, we do want to give you a little citation because we're so proud of everything that you've done and you truly were a hero. You stepped in and, and stepped up when it was needed. So Thank this you. we'd like to present to you. Thank you. Monique. What would you say to Dexter today? I would like to say thank you. There's really not enough words for me to express the gratitude and appreciation that I feel towards you. I thank you for trusting what you were feeling in your intuition. I think a lot of people should follow that. I see you as a hero. And I just thank you and just continue to be you. Quite welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I hug her? <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> oh. Monique, we just want to thank you for coming on the show. We wish you and your family all the best. Dexter, yes. you truly are an M.MTA hero. We thank you for following your instincts and, and stepping up and jumping in and saving lives. You know, Thank on behalf of M.MT, I think you did a job well done. So we want to commend you for that. Thank you. So again, thank you both for coming on the show and sharing thank your you experience. For this. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the end of another edition of Commuter Connections. Thanks for joining us. Happy New Year. We'll see you next time. <laughs>